going live. Wow. Hi, everybody. And welcome to the uh, first views with Nora Ghazi Safadi. Welcome. Thank you. This is a new format. So um, we're just going to explore this a little bit. And I just, uh, Nora just joined us. Um, she's live in. You're in where right now? I'm in Paris now. But with this, I feel I'm everywhere. <laughs> The, the amazing thing is we tried to do this on Monday and there was a power power outage. And I, I immediately I said, like, where are you? I had to think, where are you? Are you? And then I, I asked my French friend, I said, hey, can you believe there's power outages in France? Like, what is this? And he said, oh, that's normal. <laughs> so it's interesting. Yeah, actually, uh, today also I ran off internet. <laughs> so, like, uh, I feel home here in Paris. Like, there is no electricity, uh, no uh, hot water sometimes, and today no internet. And um, this time is full of media interviews, and a lot of media are just live because of the amnesty decree, a presidential amnesty decree, the last one in, in Syria. So I'm just not able to do anything because of electricity or internet. I feel like <laughs> home, really. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> it's so bad, but I mean, it's it, we laugh because it's it seems to be the state of the world now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing? Uh, what am I doing now, or in general? In general. Okay. Um. I'm Nora, <laughs> and I'm a human rights lawyer for more than 18 years now. And for 18 years, I've been working on the arbitrary detention and enforced disappearance in Syria. But the last uh, couple of years, I'm reflecting all my experience and expertise on Syria, but also on another context, because this file of arbitrary detention and specifically enforced disappearance, because they are related to each other somehow, um, like they they are happening or happened in the past uh, in most of the countries of the world. So some countries like there is no more enforced disappearance, um, but still like the result and um, uh, consequences still going on um, because I have this experience not only as a profession but also in my personal life as I, I had this experience with my father for several times when I was a child and teenager and then with Basil, my, my husband. So to mix between personal and professional life is something very tiring and hectic but Sometimes it's all the time, actually, it's very useful for others who suffer from the same. That's interesting. So the audience here is probably a lot of uh, people from North America and uh, from from U.S. and uh, Canada. So um, it's interesting for me because I was always taught that, like, there is a kind of a separation between personal and and professional life. But I learned from from traveling globally and working that actually the higher you go, the more it's blended. Yeah, in my case, there is no way to separate between them. Um, I, I'm trying actually, but really there is no no way. And I think the power in my work and I became a kind of influencer because this mix between my personal and professional life. Right, absolutely. <laughs> And the funny part is, like, when you said that last joke about, like, the power out, it reminded me of uh, the humor from uh, Syrian style humor, which is very, like, straight to tell the joke, but not to smile or laugh. But you laughed. So I can see you're in Paris. <laughs> yeah. Um, now I live in the smallest place in my entire life. Like, during the conflict in Syria, sometimes I slept in streets, in gardens but not at this kind of size like i'm with my dog and cat we are three 
creatures in 18 meters. Wow, what a space. And I mean, and with no arbitrary inside. Yes. And with arbitrary detention, um, you know, it's people, you know, we've talked to before you, you and I have about how these spaces and this, the, you, you know, we don't really know where people are disappeared and we don't know their conditions. And that's, I think that's to, to, for people to understand the, your work. Um, I think they have to understand how uh, the state of people and what they're in and what their family's left in. Can you just describe that like a little bit? Like, what is it like to not know about your loved ones? Uh, okay, to explain this, um, I would like to, to say something about my childhood because the first time that I lost my father, uh, I was at five. And at that age, it's like, it's very weird and difficult to understand why my father disappeared. But just when I was like seven, eight, I know like, okay, my father is wanted by the security because he has a cause. Like I know the word cause, but I know I don't know what does it mean. I'm I'm very like little girl to know what does it mean. And when my father uh, got detained, his ninth time, I was eleven. Nine. Ninth time. Yes, wow. I was eleven, and I used to tell my friends at school that um, because they used to say that okay, your father is a prisoner. I was telling, no, he's not a prisoner. He's a detainee. I know that there is a di a differences between detainee and the prisoner, but I cannot explain because I'm very little girl to, to know every, everything. And at that yeah. time, I, I thought prison is just for good people. So I thought that prisons in Syria and in the world is just for the good people. So if you need to find any good person, you have to go to prison to find him. Wow. And then when I was just 13, I just decided to become a human rights lawyer and to defend prisoners of conscience and uh, political prisoners. And this is what I did. And actually, when I had to, to go to university, I, I really wanted to be an actress, not a human rights lawyer. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But and you like, decided I, at 13? You were 13 and you decided? Yes. Yes. I, yeah. know, I know you've told me this story before, and it's so amazing, like how you... <laughs> decided it have you can you share that yeah yeah because um okay so my father was uh, referred to the uh, supreme security state court and um, so when he had session at this court for his trial i used to hug him and kiss him and then one of the military policemen pushed me and the officer at that time he provoked me uh, with some words so i cursed the assad father in the streets at that age. And uh, like, it was a kind of threat by me that, okay, I will grow up and become a human rights lawyer and defend all these prisoners of conscience. I just want to see that. I wish I had a time machine to see you as a 13 year old saying this out loud. It's and so I was powerful. very tiny, like for, <laughs> for now I'm very tiny. So imagine I was 13. Like I and was so like, like yeah, I mean, the amazing part is you wanted to be an actress, but then you make this statement and it's almost like a a film role, you know, that you you were making the statement in public. Yeah, and I like I had so many movies, but actually I just wanted to study to study uh, acting as an academic. Right. Issue. I, I don't know if I will do it one day uh, because I'm <laughs> focusing on languages lately. <laughs> Like each two years, I need to to learn a new language. So okay, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> that was another Syrian style joke, everyone. <laughs> How many languages do you speak now? Because I mean, essentially, I, I wouldn't say you have forced migration, but it's like uh, encouraged migration that's happened, right? Yeah. So, how many languages do you speak now? How many places have you lived now since um, leaving Syria? Okay, so I left Syria like a bit more than four years ago. I, I lived in Lebanon, then in Turkey, now in Paris. But I, I spent some time live in three places. Like I have flat in three countries. Like all my stuff are distributed in three countries. So it's very hectic. So now... Okay. I know that problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. And with a cat and a dog, it's more problem. 
I know. Uh, so, um, like, I had the intention to learn French since a lot of years because my sister is a French teacher. So I always envy her that she, she speaks French. It's very, very elegant language. But then I needed to learn Turkish because I moved to Turkey and Turkish don't speak English. Right. <laughs> so um, speaking Turkish, um, I'm a bit forgetting my Arabic, like the classic Arabic. Um, and uh, I, I had to start learning French two months ago. And I'm still continuing Turkish because I'm studying academic Turkish. So I like, I need two, three months to complete Turkish. But now wow. I'm beginner at French, but uh, I think I, I, um, I pick up language very fast, usually. Yeah. But my plan Obviously. Is, yeah, my plan is to learn Spanish after French and then to stop learning language. So oh, that's it. You're, you'll learn, then you'll know the top. Oh, if you want to complete the set, you have to learn Chinese. So no, no way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then after you live there, then you're going to go to Spain. It sounds like. <laughs> I love Spain. And Spanish is very easy, especially if you speak English and French, it will be very yeah. easy. Yeah, Amazing. But I love languages and especially that I, I, I had a diploma in translation, Arabic, English. So this um, taught me to think more about each word. Um, yeah. I, I really enjoy it. Like uh, today was my second French class. Wow. Because I was in Lebanon and they started French class without me, but I, I did a kind of self-study. So the French teacher, she was amazed because, oh my God, you are writing right, you are reading right, you know a lot of words. And it's like very fast. And I don't know how. <laughs> I just understand. It must, yeah, it, it must be, you know, you, you know. <laughs> but also I think women seem to be better at languages, right? I mean, I'm um, as an American and I'm already you know, bad at languages, it seems, right? <laughs> but um, I don't know if it's woman, but woman uh, like like study more than men, but it's uh, something in, um, I don't know, there is something in the brain responsible uh, of languages. Right, I know computer language. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, you know? <laughs> no, I'm just- oh, No, no, I'm very bad in these issues. So after you were, um, so you're, you know, you made this uh, decree, you're in the streets, you say, I, I'm i going to come back and I'm going to fight for all the detainees. Then how, what continued after that? How did you, how did you meet um, Basil? I studied law and I was the youngest lawyer in Syria because I was just 22 when I became a lawyer. And in 2004, I started to defend a uh, prisoner of conscience before the, uh, the, no, the Supreme Security State Court. And after seven years, the revolution started in Syria. I met Basel in April, on April 1, 2011, during a demonstration. And a friend to us, he was uh, detained and then Basel used to, uh, to accompany me to the court. And for some months, Basel wanted to study law. And he Good wanted luck. to be a lawyer, actually, yeah. And um, so because I, I had the access to the central prison of Damascus, which is Adra prison, um, so I could, um, I could meet a lot of prisoners and get their testimonies to the INGOs, especially this period that Basel was in Adra prison. Like, because for three years, I was visiting Basel two or three times every week. So, and I didn't visit him alone because I used to visit another prisoners as a lawyer. So wow. through these three years, I got more than 400 testimonies. I visited more than 400 male prisoners. Wow. It's too much. So for many years, I was like the main resource of all the violation in detention centers. So, and through Basel, um case like Basel was referred to Said Mayajel, was referred to the military field court. So I reflect through free Basel campaign and everything uh, that happened with Basel. I reflect this on another detainee that in Said Mayajel and in uh, referred to military field court. So I got the attention on these issues. And until now, the 
these shifts are still going on by the international community, international NGOs and other Syrian activists. And um, like, uh, unfortunately, it's like too, too bad the situation, especially in San Nigel, because like in Syria, we have many types of detention centers. We have almost five types of detention centers. So the, the worst two types is, or three types is the security intelligence, the secret prisons and Sadnaya Jail. Sadnaya Jail is now uh, considered as one of the worst jail in the world. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I, I'm also curious about um, the interplay of, of governments in Syria. Um, so we came together, of course, through, through, through Basel and um, that's how we first met, but we didn't meet until after that in person, which is another story we should get to as well. Um, but we, Basil and I met because of Creative Commons and through our love of technology and open source. And we very quickly after we met, we, we created um, Creative Commons Syria. And that's, that's where we, we just instantly met, it was like best friends. It was just done, you know? And um, then of course, through the, through the various trials and tribulations, through opening the hackerspace, IQ Lab, and then the conversion of, of IQ Lab really into the kind of place for people to hang out. So when the Arab Spring broke out in, in Damascus, it was really kind of a hub for people to kind of come in and out. Um, for not for anything weird, it was just it was just a place where young people would hang out. And um, then that's how I got to know you through once you guys, once this, this protest really broke out. Um, so I, I'm, for me, there's a part there. I don't know all the details on the ground of everything, but what was that like um, whenever you, you, you had met Basil in person from the protest and, and uh, up until when he got picked up? And uh, the strangest thing that um, Basel used to hate lawyers and I used to hate technology. <laughs> so he speaks code, you speak law. <laughs> but somehow, like for the first time of my life, he puts me as a student and explained to me the differences between hardware and software, which is not in like something in my interesting, but I was just enjoying because it's Basel who's speaking and then as I told you just a few minutes before he really wanted to become a lawyer <laughs> but what we have in common is um, and this what make our like relationship succeeded somehow is that we have uh, very common ideas about the revolution the non-violence uh, struggle um and religion things and like social life things um and also because um i'm very like i'm not like uh the other woman in such community like syria like i'm very often i express my feeling my fears my thoughts um i don't have any problem with anything um and he is like he was the same so we became very close friends before uh, falling in love. And then we just fell in love very, very soon. And we decided to, to get married very soon also. We, like when we had the decision, when he asked me to marry him, uh, we've been in relationship for just 25 days. And I didn't say yes until now. <laughs> Sounds familiar. I don't want to compare. I don't want you to compare stories um, uh, <laughs> with anyone here in my my world. <laughs> but you know, this all reminds me. And you know, um, after what had happened, and you know, just to continue the story, um, then of course, like Basil was picked up, and we no one knew why, and it was a real. We we had no idea. So it was the kind of the beginning of this disappearance, and. Um, then later, you know, we, we, we worked together on trying to free him. And that's when I first really met you, I think, is we, you know, we launched the Free Basil campaign 
and we, we, we worked really hard, which then, you know, we, we were just trying all types of different ways to keep attention on him. And one of those was the new Palmyra project, which, which did uh, a lot to bring attention to, to Basil because he is, he was already building culture up and, and, um, he was working hard to, uh, focus on the, the amazing, um, gifts from the Syrian people. Um, and um, I think that also leads to another topic, which is, um, you know, people in the here in the United States heard about Palmyra. That was very clear. Somehow, like the destruction of like columns and uh, these things maybe even gets more attention in some ways than like the human tragedy, which is really strange, maybe because of capitalism. I'm not sure. But we also heard a lot here about, um, you know, Russia and the interplay in Russia in, in, in both Damascus and also in Palmyra. Um, since Russia and Ukraine war is happening right now, I'm just curious if you, you could talk a little bit about that, Russia and the involvement in Syria. Yeah, actually, it's very important topic to talk about because there is a kind of comparing between Syria and Ukraine, because like the Russian are involved in both countries. And the problem is that there is this com comparing is not like going very well, because, for example, Syrian, some Syrian keep saying that, OK, now all the European countries like open their doors for Ukrainian, but this is not uh, the, uh, the case in Syria. But no, actually, we've been in the conflict for 11 years now in Syria. And at the beginning, for sure, like most of the countries just opened doors uh, for, for us, actually. And that's why there is like almost a million Syrians in right. between Europe, Canada and US. So this is not the case. And the, the other thing is Ukraine is in like in the middle of Europe, like it's it's normal. They are the, the neighbors of Ukraine. But the, the sad thing is that, OK, as Syrian activists, we uh, we warned a lot of the Syrian inter, uh, of the Russian intervention in the Syrian context and the Russian role now in a try to lead the world. But nobody took us uh, seriously. And it, this is politics now because, OK, there is no any benefit or interest for the international community now for any political change or transition in Syria. But now after Ukraine, now, like most of Europe are threatened to be lack of gas, lack of fuel, lack of uh, some uh, basic uh, materials and Actually, I'm just afraid. I'm, I'm very sympathetic, uh, sympathetic with Ukrainian and with, with, with anyone in the world that have kind of injustice. But I'm afraid um, like for the Ukrainian to face the same fate like us. Like it will be like one day that the international community will think just about his own uh, benefits and interest, and they will just turn the attitude and position toward what is happening in Ukraine. And actually, one of the things that one of my plans here in 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 front, but I talked with the main uh, entities about it, is to have a kind of debate or public event between Syrian activists and Ukrainian activists because we we have a lot of things in common. And for me personally not only as an activist, but also as a person who suffered a lot, a person who is very traumatized and is still traumatized. I really want to help somehow in like uh, the way uh, of documenting, for example, the way of dealing with this trauma, like everyday trauma. I, I really I want to have a chance to, to help Ukrainian or, or other people, maybe. I'm like, it's, it's too hard, really, it's too hard. I mean, to do your work, you have to have a big heart. And I think you're hitting on a, a topic, which is, um, you, you know, this type of work you have to give yourself wholly to. Um, so your heart is big and has to develop to become even bigger. But how do you um, refill your heart from doing all this type of work? Uh... I'm always asked this question by by people because I need also to re refill my energy 
because like I'm not only uh, like work as a lawyer or human rights activist, but also like a lot of people consider me like psychologist. And you, when you are, you are playing this role somehow, like people need, needed you to, to play this role, you need some something else. But um, I have a lot of good friends. I have Zios and Sisi. Like they, they give me all the love and energy that I need. And sometimes they disturb me, okay. <laughs> and um, I still yeah, have... Yeah, it just goes too far. I mean, sometimes people's demands, you, sometimes you've used all your heart energy <laughs> and you just can't... Oh, there we go. There's one of the hearts. Yeah, the yeah, yes. No, Pets. <laughs> because he's, he's hearing the neighbors. <laughs> so he need to yeah. prove that his dog, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, a, that's such a challenge. Um, just you have... Can you describe a little bit? I'm gonna go back to the um, to the disappeared. So, um, can you describe a little bit like the the demand whenever you have a loved one that's disappeared? Like, what's that demand on on you, like, or another person? Like my demand regarding uh, yeah, I mean, like whenever this happened, I mean, it was one thing to be a lawyer and helping people, but it was another thing then actually have like your father disappeared and then basil disappeared so maybe you can describe that a little bit like how that affects um you and then the family um um like i'm still living um under this impact since even my father like i'm still doing sessions with my psychologist because i feel guilty toward my father because when he was released, I was teenager, I was 15. This is toward the last time. And um, at that age, I was just waiting for him to have a kind of reparation for me um, about his absence. But the case was on the contrary, like my father uh, went out of prison. He was very tired. He was without work. He needs to be rehabilitated. And for more than 10 years, uh, we were in continuing fighting. And actually when I, like there, almost when the revolution started and my relationship with Basel started, I just re-looked really at my relationship with my father and, and to my father himself. So now we're like the best friends. And because of his detention and because of my visits to him in prison and because of his advices, I could be successful with Basel during his staying in prison. And I'm successful at my work because I work in my heart first, then in my brain. Right. And because that the senior context is very complicated and there is no hope, the reality is very bad and ugly and frustrating. And especially the file of infants disappear, and there is no hope. And in most cases, those people are dead. So, and as a lawyer, that families are asking me about specific details to try to, to have a kind of scenario about the fate of their beloved ones, I need to be, to say the truth. And saying the truth is very hard to the families. So I need to calm them down and to follow up with them on a daily basis and also to, to try to help them how to deal with this because at this wow. situation there is no recovery like for me for example i didn't see basil body so i i'm still uncertain about his fate okay, i know like, i was saying that i was saying the same thing to um to here to my to the person i was saying that i said i said you know one you know because i just read the news about there were several um there was news that there were releases of disappeared in syria I don't know yeah. how this went through. I saw this, I didn't, but um, and I, I, I looked at uh, my friend and I said, um, I, I still think Basil's going to come out. I still think if he shows up, I will accept it. I still have that feeling, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's easier for me now. So you're, you're sharing me the same, the same feeling or expectation or yeah. maybe fears um so now like because there is a, a presidential uh, amnesty decree so a lot of uh, like hundreds of detainees and um, disappeared are released wow and actually there is tens of those detainees like their um their families received their death certificates but they are wow. released now so it's really very confusing 
and yeah. um because i like i'm just dealing with this open wound every day yeah. every moment yeah i i could help the others to just deal with it <laughs> I, I don't like to use the word recover or um forget because there is no recovery or forgetting now yeah you and you don't want to forget i mean and that's a very um kind of um i like i i approach these problems as i'm i'm just this guy from missouri who's like a farmer so when i say these things it comes from this comes from my perspective but I, that also is a very kind of like almost christian like guilty feeling guilty um you know this is i'm guilty you know it's, it's a tough thing to get through that and uh it's also maybe not the right perspective because um uh, uh uh, my my friend Ai Weiwei says, you know, he, you, know, you say sorry to him, he'll get mad. He'll say, no, then why did you do it? You know, why did you do that? And I didn't understand that until I, I, I meet him and talk about this, you know? So it's like you don't want to forget these problems. And it's it, because you don't want to forget the people. It's, an, it's another type of uh, way of staying engaged with them. Yeah. Yeah, and especially that I'm running this NGO that help family and the Tunis to survive, to deal with it, to try to get benefit of this because, okay, everyone in life, even those people who don't live in conflict, but everyone has his own suffering. And you can live your suffering in, in bad way or good way, in negative yeah. way or positive way. So like, like because of my suffering, I'm very helpful to others, for example. Right. Um, because of, and yes, I just yesterday I was telling a, a, a lady from Myanmar that, okay, um, like, okay, you could be tired, but you could be tired with a tear or with a smile. <laughs> totally. It's your choice. I completely agree. I completely agree with that. Yeah, that's the hard part is, you know, you have to have the ca capacity to be able to handle other people's issues and problems but because you've gone through it you know how to get through the suffering faster <laughs> right yeah. and that's yeah. what you're 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 basically conveying that to other people so yeah wow exactly because they look at me as not only a lawyer but um, i have the same story like them and uh, and also they support me <laughs> Like it's a yeah. kind of circle, like, you know, it's a community that supports each other, which is yeah. really like we launched a family association just like uh, 45 days ago. And it's right. 100 women of uh, former <laughs> detainees. Yeah. And um, families of current detainees and infants disappeared. And it's like, it, it's really amazing. No, no, we I'm focusing on this family association because amazing. their role is really for family. And I hate to use this word of victims and survivor. I'm not a victim. Right. I'm not a survivor. Yeah. Like I'm still right. suffering, but I'm not a yeah. victim because I'm suffering because of my <laughs> own choice. That's right. That's right. That's right. You chose it. That's right. That's yes. that's a healthy way to look at it. What do you think of the term refugee? Um, what do you mean by this question exactly? Well, I mean, there's so much discussion about, you know, like Ukraine, right? There's so many, so many people fled from Ukraine now. And it's all oh, there's, you know, people are, you know, refugees. So you can look at like, also the, there are people from uh, other places that are pushed out, you know, from, from the Syrian conflict before they were refugees. So I'm just curious, like how you view, maybe you view yourself or in relationship to that term. And is it similar? Yeah. You don't like victim or survivor? Yeah, but like uh, refugees is something like this, the, the correct description, like, uh, okay, uh, I will become a refugee very soon. I will apply for asylum in France, so I will have the status of being a refugee. It'll be and, the first time. Yeah, it's my Legally, first Legally, you'll be a refugee then. <laughs> yeah. So, um, like in Syria, before the conflict, we had... Uh, Palestinian refugees and then we had Iraqi refugees and this is normal when some conflict happened at uh, some certain places like people just run away to another places but 
it it had so much problems actually because there is two kinds of refugees those refugees who are in the neighboring countries and the refugees in the asylum countries and okay like there is like there is always racism there is always discrimination like this is something one of the human being disease like um right. and there is no much politics that prevent this kind of discrimi discrimination and racism but um also we we need to put ourselves in the other position that okay those like for example lebanon it's like 11 years now it's too much for a country like lebanon who already collapsed politically right. socially economic so it's too much but okay for us we we are not able to go back to our country so the the this the uh, the voluntary return there is no way to voluntary return now so it must be a kind of laws or international con convention for refugees especially in the neighboring countries because for example in europe when someone gets asylum he will have uh, at least like the minimum of his needs uh, the rehabilitation the psychosocial support the medical care but in those countries like turkey jordan and lebanon there is nothing and those refugees are existed anyway so it has to be a kind of free settlement for them to have work to have education to have medical care legal care psychosocial care because they suffer wow. a lot more than other people actually and this is just related to the donors countries actually wow wow yeah and i also learned this uh, the classification comes from the united nations so you know in the us there's a lot of uh on, there's certain kinds of discussion about like United Nations doesn't serve the United States interests, but it seems, um, I'm curious your perspective on this United Nations and these programs. Um, okay, um, because I'm a lawyer and activist, so I need and I have to deal with UN. Uh, but one of the things that we have to do in the world is to abolish the UN and to create another entity, a potential entity, alternative one because most of the problems in the world are because of the UN. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought they started with people. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. That's interesting perspective. Is, so this is that's so this is um, a kind of perspective that there has there needs to be something that's improved. So that does kind of align with some interests what you see in the United States of what people say. Um, so I'm I'm curious as well. Um, so your work then you you moved from some damascus to lebanon and can you just describe what you did whenever you moved from after we we found out about basil being disappeared and then unfortunately um we believe he was executed um what happened then when you moved to to um beirut and what project did you do can you just talk about that Okay, so I moved to Beirut for security reasons, like I had to leave Syria because I was afraid to be killed or arrested. Um, so I moved to Beirut for uh, six months. This what uh, was my intention because I had scholarship in UK, in evening, but I, I just wanted to be away and to focus on something else, not only on Syria, but like after two months uh, or less than three months of moving to Beirut, it was the mother day in Lebanon and Syria. And I celebrated it the first time without my mom, but with another moms and wives of detainees. And I thought, OK, I need to stay with those people because I belong to them. And I need to establish my project with Basel, which is no photo zone. I'm not able to be far away from Syria. I need to be in the middle of Syrian coast. So I established No Photo Zone. And I remember very well that when Basel chose this name, I wasn't agree. But there is no Basel physically, just physically. So I just needed to keep uh, his legacy, his memory, and to do it. I changed a bit. Like the, the, the concept of No Photo Zone is to provide legal support. 
and to raise awareness about detention issues in Syria. So I did it, and we're doing this for four years now, more than four years. Amazing. Syria and Lebanon, and this year we're going to start working in Istanbul as well. Oh, so, really? Okay, so you're yeah. expanding to the, to the disappeared. That's amazing. And one of the dreams uh, that I'm seeking to is to, to turn off the zone one day to international NGO, like to work on enforced disappearance in, in each place that have enforced disappearance. Yeah. Um, and with the COVID, with the financial challenges, uh, like Syria is not priority anymore for funding and for media, for, for government, we really suffer. And But although we keep continue because like we have now in Lebanon 1,200 families who get benefit of our services on daily basis. And wow. we are, one, yeah, one of the very, very, very few Syrian NGOs that provide direct legal support, not only documentation wow. and advocacy. Wow. So our work is needed and it's not about salaries. Like we've been without salaries for months, but we cannot stop yeah. our work because we, we're going to cause a big harm to the to the like beneficiary that we are trying to help. So it's not only, it's not at all about service, but we need salaries to, to survive. Of course. Um, and also we, we provide a kind of psychosocial support, but through art, uh, theater, music, and literature. And through this work, I adopted seven musician kids. They are not kids anymore, but I call what? them kids. Like, yeah, <laughs> you've adopted kids. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, it's not like the legal word of adoption because it's different in our countries. But I'm like the the second mom. Like a god. They are no. Yeah. They are uh, like really young, but I still call them kids. So we are preparing to launch the band, and like what um, most of them, they are sons and daughters of a disappear. Um, so, and we call this band. Qarar, which is decision in English. Uh, around. Qarar. Qarar. Yeah, like Q-A-R-A-R. -A -R. Okay, Q-U-R-A-R. -R. Okay, I like yeah. it already. I like Q. And I'm, I'm a mother-in-law now because one of them got engaged. <laughs> what? Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, and they are in Lebanon and I miss them too much. Oh my gosh. Okay. So now I'm starting to see you've got the cat, you've got the dog and you have, you have kids and those, cat, you no. get, yeah, she just woke up. Yes. Yes. Is, and so seven what kids. happened to Cece, your cat? Cece? Oh, this is Cece now. Is She's that Cece? Now. Yeah. Can you hold up Cece real quick so that people can see? Oh, no. She's oh, maybe. Okay. And no, don't worry about it. But talk about Cece. Who's Cece named after? <laughs> uh, okay, so Cece is a gift from Basel on Valentine's Day of uh, 2012. He lived with her just one month be before detention. And I called her Cece for two reasons. Because the logo of Creative Commons was Cece, still Cece. Yeah. Like the two letters Cece. So all Basel stuff like have the logo Cece. Yeah. And uh, the second reason, because of a very um, famous song about a cat, the cat name is Sisi. <laughs> is, that a, is that a song in Arabic? Yeah, in Arabic. Wow. Oh, we have to share that sometime. Um, <laughs> the, you know, this reminds me so much about, um, you know, our Basil is, is in our minds all the time. And I just think so much about, like, we have so many projects and so many things that were created in 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 our attempt to transform the suffering that we were going through with him not knowing um what had happened to him um you said you have 1200 families that use no photo zone services and do you have how many do you have in 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 Turkey, or is that that's still coming, right? Uh, no, those families are still in Lebanon, but I'm in okay. direct contact with those families because I'm not only the director, I'm doing right. the sessions on the ground. And yeah. even now, like, I'm travel so much, but I'm doing them online. So, like, all those families, they have yeah. my, my WhatsApp. Like, I don't have WhatsApp for work and personal WhatsApp. Like, it's the same. It's only one. You can't keep it straight, right? It's too hard. <laughs> yeah. It's too Amazing. hard. Amazing. 
it's amazing. So when I'm, I'm, I'm always looking at things and I, I say, Oh, what about this? What about this thing in Ukraine? And you're so, um, what I, what I love about you is that you, you are a lawyer and you're very uh, practical and like you very focused on the need. And I think that's, that's really what I, I wanted to get to here is this need. And the problem whenever Basil was in, uh, when Adra, and we were, I think it was the Sednaya, right? He was in Sednaya. The, the problem there was like, there was no light that was on him. There's no, you know, spotlight. And and I think with the Free Basil campaign, we even launched us the, ba- you know, Basil like sunlight projects. So that was where New Palmyra came from. So I think the biggest challenge as you've, you've highlighted it now is that um, the, the spotlight or the sunlight is not on Syria right now. It's really on, Ukraine. And I, I, I wonder how we can get that spotlight onto your work. And that's, I think, the biggest problem is how to get you the resources that you need to really amplify your work. And what do you think? What, do you have ideas about that? Is that why you're in Paris? Is this part of it? Uh, yeah, there's two things now. Okay. Uh, like for more than 70 years, Palestine was something very central in the world. And then like a lot of conf- conflict came. And now like the Ukrainian people, they have the right to be under the light. They have the right. But also there is another conflict in the world, not only in Syria, in all, most of the world. So it's the responsibility of the activists of those countries that live among conflicts to keep attention. This is the first thing. The second thing that is always like we are a human being and there is a humanity that gather us. So we sometimes, okay, we have different contexts, but we have some mutual suffering. What I'm focusing on now is not only to keep attention on my country, um, but also to keep attention on this file that I work on, like I spent almost half of my life working on. By gathering the other uh, activists, the other um, uh, like who had the same experience on this in the world, because we have it. one direction to work, one suffering and one demand. Yes. And this is what I'm trying to do now. It's It doesn't about just Syria anymore when we're talking about uh, arbitrary detention and enforced disappearance. Yeah. Like we have this in Iraq, we have this in Myanmar. We have this yeah. in Lebanon. We have this in uh, Argentina. We have this in in many countries in Africa, in in Asia, in like even in Spain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what am I doing in France? Like um, I was selected by President Macron uh, to honor as woman human rights defender. This is an initiative for a human for honoring human rights defenders in the world, and um, the first one who got this. We are now 15 uh, women wow. human rights defenders from 12 countries. And we had this program for six months in Paris to do a lot of um, human rights training, to give a lot of uh, lectures, to have a kind of resilience and well being, to learn French. And like they offered us to get a, political, a kind of political asylum. So right. um, wow. enjoying this. And we are a part of designing this program, which name is Marianne program, like Marianne is the sample of uh, uh, the, the Republic of France. Oh. And uh, so I'm very proud to do this. And just yesterday I did a presentation on Syria and on my activism and on Basel. It was really nice. So inspiring each other is very uh important like some uh, some of us work on democratic change some of us also work on arbitrary detention some of us work on lgbtq rights some of us work on climate change so there is diversity of activism and Amazing. somehow they are linked to each other and we Amazing. we live in the same building and right that's like, wild uh, yeah that's wild. so why do you think why why is this important to the french and the french government or maybe to the president um, you, can you hypothesize? Maybe you don't want to. I know it's okay also. No, it's okay. This is a free country. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Yeah, everything's okay. free. The, the president is very nice and his wife is very nice. I and met you him. met him. You yeah. met him both. Yeah. Amazing. And he's very handsome. 
<laughs> we need some film cameras there. <laughs> it's really very nice. And uh, it was very embarrassing because when he entered the, the meeting room, he just came to me directly and I didn't realize that this is the president. So he said, <laughs> like, he just gave me his hand and he said, bonjour. And I said, bonjour. And then I said, oh my God, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah, so he just laughed. Um, yeah, uh, I think um, President Macron is interested in, in human rights and in women role particularly. Yeah. But I think also it's for elections somehow, like the timing. Yeah. Um, well, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of immigrants in, in France now. Isn't yeah. There? Yeah, so and I'm very happy that he won. He's the president now for I mean, Yeah, that's that's very helpful to you that you got it you got into into France and then he won after that too. <laughs> yeah, and for me it's totally acceptable for anyone to use us uh for elections because I'm Syrian. I'm getting used to be used in election in, in <laughs> you're, all countries. you're used to being used. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, yeah. it's so good. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. And I will get a master's. We just discussed today to have a really? diploma in French, to do a master's in French, not English. Oh my gosh. And it's really funny because I was studying academic Turkish to get a master's in Istanbul in Turkish. Wow. And in one day, my, my entire life just changed. Like That's I was amazing. preparing myself to, to have a like of depression celebration because the day after was... Uh, the fourth anniversary of leaving Syria and like the ninth anniversary of getting married with Basil and they just yeah. uh, the French consulate in Istanbul called me and they told me that you are selected for this program by the president amazing 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 oh my god you can't apply for that <laughs> no there's no application they just selected me <laughs> yeah is it all right I was like Thank what you. me I'm, I and mean, the funny that, thing that yeah. my family not knew about this after four days because they have no electricity and internet. Amazing. And I told this to the president. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. That's wild. Did you? So it's a funny that then now the power's out there. <laughs> now where you are as well, right? It's like the, now you know. Now we come full circle on on the issue. That's so after the pandemic. Um, and the pandemic was hard for everybody. We have we have one global shared trauma, that's for sure. For anyone who's connected to the internet, at least, and to the to the travel and everything. So um, now you're there, and I mean, what a, an encouragement to your work, um, and what a what a, you know, hopefully this is a string of just successes on 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 No Photo Zone. And I wanted to say one thing. Whenever I I first heard of No Photo Zone. I, I didn't know what it was, but I remember it was like looking at all the places there are no cameras. That was kind of my translation of it. Yes. So, yes. I mean, there's so yeah. many places where there, that can go, you know, all the places where cameras can't go because it provides some type of view into um, the challenges and the, and the problems. So how can people help get their camera into these zones where the camera can't go? Uh, like reflecting or illustrating the stories, the suffering, the needs and demands of those families and people through uh, new tools and also to enable them, to empower them by giving them uh, new skills to survive. And it's very needed, like, and I, as I just told you that, okay, we we have very limited funds so that's why we just launched a crowdfunding campaign like three weeks ago and we gonna it will uh continue for almost uh, six or seven weeks and so we need to have a stability to our work we need to make sure that we are continuing our activities and our services to those people who are really in need and we don't want just to depend on the fund of some entities and governments because we're not a priority anymore as Syrians and uh, so that's why we need this stability because I'm really um, I have my fears to stop this work not only because it's very useful to the others but because it's 
very related to Basel legacy for me. Like this is like the name that Basel chose, the yep. the work that Basel wanted me to do. Um. So yeah. So we want people to donate. <laughs> this is what yeah, we yeah. want actually yeah. to keep this work and to engage yeah. the families more and more because the families must be the representatives of this. It's not only about us as human rights activists. Right. Those, those people have the right to speak, to express and to be heard and seen by, by the media, by the international community, by everyone who is involved and interested in this fight. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this has been really amazing time to talk and I hope everyone enjoyed this. I, I will be sharing kind of a recap and I'll put some of these links, also links to the to the campaign. And I, I just wanted to say thank you for um, joining us too. This is the first, you know, interview, or as we're calling them, views. And um, I thought it would be appropriate that that you and I do this um, as the it first great. one I, I honor, really to honor Basil and to you know also honor honor life. You know, it's we we might feel. I, you know, you feel guilty sometimes, this complex of being a survivor. And um, I, of course, no photo zone can't end. It can't end at all. It, it, that would be the end of our life. And we're not going to do it. So we're going to do everything we can to support you and get you get you and the team what they need. So thank yeah. you so much. I really enjoyed it. I'm good idea. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, I'm going to end the broadcast.